I'm Michael Forrester and let's dive into what is Amazon Web Services. Let's talk about specifically what Amazon Web Services is. Okay, we're gonna talk just a moment about how AWS compares to traditional IT and where the difference exists. So I want you to think of it this way. Think of a traditional IT shop as you having to get a kitchen, cheese, tomatoes, everything you need to make a pizza. You're making it yourself. You're making you to put all the components together. Or if you don't mind losing a little bit of control, you can just go to Pizza Hut. Now I chose Pizza Hut because I think Pizza Hut is pretty decent. Obviously there are special pizza shops that are better, but I digress. What's important here is that Amazon Web Services is like a place that you go to have a lot of those operational concerns offloaded. So think of it as having a pizza made for you where you just consume pizza versus in traditional IT where you are having to make the pizza yourself. Now, if we convert that to our tech idea that we had before in cloud computing, imagine that you wanna produce an idea with new tech, but this time you're not using traditional IT, you're using AWS. Now here's what happens. In our original request for traditional data center requests, you had to request the server hardware, like racks and stuff like that. You had to request the networking cables, the internet connection, you had to request power, you had to request server placement with cooling. You had to have operations and security come in and install. And then you got access. And then once you had access, and sometimes this could take days, this could take weeks, this could take months, then you were free to install your software that you were looking for. AWS, this is not how things happen. With AWS, this is much different. So instead, it's a lot more automated. So instead of having to provision hardware, you just talk to a hardware service that includes all the networking, the cooling, and the power already. Now, instead of managing physical objects like data centers with the cooling and power and servers, you're now just accessing services like virtual machine services or database services or application services. In most cases, they're already installed and you just configure with ease what it is that you're looking for. So if we look back at our original diagram about what is cloud computing, you notice that the basic components are here. You've got networking at the top and you've got computers in the upper right hand side and you've got disk and data storage and you've got governance and security and all the stuff just right here. So imagine if all of these was replaced with specific services or groups of services inside of AWS or Amazon Web Services. And this is the secret sauce is that AWS wants to consume and eat your operational overhead. They want to eat some of your security overhead. They want it. They want you to spend your money with them so that they can take that off your plate. And we'll get into why that is later, but this is what Amazon Web Services does. Now there's these core service categories. So we've got compute, we've got storage, which could also be data, right? Then we've got our networking and content delivery, and this is where we get internet access, and this is how we control things like firewalls and security and stuff like that. We've got databases in the lower left-hand side, and this is databases like that are more cutting edge, like MongoDB, or it could be your traditional databases like Oracle and Microsoft. And then you've got the things you need to get these other four categories to work, which is security, identity, and compliance. And of course, you do need some management and governance, even at a startup, because, you know, who's going to manage these systems, right? Who's going to monitor them when they're down? Who's going to make sure they're patched? That kind of thing. So these are the core service categories. Now, there's three ways that you can interact with AWS. Now, these are the three kind of general ways. Obviously, you get the details and there's more. But the first is that Amazon has a product called their management console, which is just nothing more than a web page. We're going to look at that in just a second. And the web page is great to learn and confirm. They call this the console. They call it the management console. Sometimes they call it the Amazon, the AWS web page. But this is one of the first easiest learned ways to interact and create objects on AWS. The second is called the AWS command line interface. And this is where you type in commands such as AWS space EC2 space describe instances. And what you're doing is you are using AWS's pre-configured command line, pre-built command line, 
and you have to do some authentication setup and it's very easy to do that. And what it does is it allows you to type in commands into your terminal and it will actually talk to AWS and you can both get information and you can manipulate objects and services out on AWS as well. This is great for engineers, developers of all types, but particularly operations folks tend to find the CLI, the AWS command line interface to be spectacular. Third, and certainly not the least, but arguably also the most powerful, is that AWS has what's called software development kits. Think of these as libraries of actions that you can stick inside of your application. So let's say you're a Python developer, just as an example. And you're like, I really want to manipulate virtual machines in AWS. AWS has a software development kit for Python where you can import the libraries necessary to manipulate virtual machines or to manipulate containers or to create networking. And they have it for most major languages. So they have it for Java, they have it for JavaScript. You can see Ruby up here. And this is really for people who like write code and all of the different variations of that role. So there's three ways. There's the console, there's the CLI, and then there's software development kits are the three ways that people generally interact with AWS. So let's switch gears for just a second and let's roll over to the management console. So this is the management console. And as you can see here, it's got that compute category that we saw earlier. It's got that storage category that we saw earlier. Here's the database category. Up here is the management and governance category. Here is security and compliance. We also got other things like cost management, machine learning. Here's the networking and content delivery. And notice there's a bunch of other things out here. You do not need to know everything that AWS has to offer. If you are intimidated by even seeing this webpage, congratulations, you're a human being. We all get overwhelmed. I've been doing this for 12 years. Even I look at this and go, oof, that's a lot. So take that in because you do not need to know everything here, but you probably need to know just one or two sentences about EC2, maybe a few sentences about S3. So there's a number of services, which is exactly why you're taking this course, that are gonna guide you through what you need to know to pass the cloud practitioner exam. Be aware that this is the web interface. So by the way, we could come in here and click on S3, and this would take us into the S3 interface. Notice there's gonna be a bunch of words here that nobody really understands. And then we're gonna see all of our buckets that we use for various tasks inside of AWS. That is the web console. And now we're at the end so we can summarize a little bit. So what is AWS? So if cloud computing is the on-demand consumption of AT resources, just know that AWS was the first large-scale cloud provider. They were the ones who pioneered the on-demand delivery of IT resources. So the first, arguably the largest, they definitely have the largest market share. So it's a great place to start when you're looking for a certification. Second, AWS was launched in 2006 with S3 as the first service, and they announced actually SQS shortly thereafter, which you're gonna learn what the S3 and SQS are, but basically S3 is the storage service. Think of it as Google Drive or Dropbox. Since then, AWS has grown to 300 plus macro services. So really large services that have subservices underneath them, but don't panic. You're only gonna learn about maybe 20 to 30 of those services at the most superficial level. You are not gonna have to know how to deploy, master, design, architects. And so when we get to the exam guide, you're gonna see that you just, at this level, you really just need to be able to talk about AWS, but there are 300 plus services out there. And just know that signing up for AWS, if you want to get off this video and go right away with a phone number and a credit card and sign up for an account, signing up is free. And most of the services actually are free or have a free tier, which we were gonna talk about through this course. But at some point, a lot of the services are pay to use, meaning if you start up a virtual machine, you're gonna pay for the virtual machine, as an example. And last but not least, just know that AWS has one of the largest communities, the largest market position, and even to this day, still some of the largest growth in the industry as it relates to hyperscale cloud providers. Thanks for listening and watching. We're gonna definitely catch you in the next video.